Blog Talk Radio. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to another episode of House Talk Pregame. I'm your co-host, Ronnie Ransom of Virginia State University. Um, I also have with me Jared Johnson of Bowie State University. <clears throat> Unfortunately, this morning, Dr. Pitt, Dr. Lauren Pitts isn't able to be with us this morning. Um, her family is currently mourning the loss of a loved one. So for all of those who are listening this morning, let's please extend our condolences and prayers to Dr. Pitts and her family as they're going through this uh, tough time with their family. Um, you know, COVID is definitely, you know, hasn't been playing fair this year. And, you know, a lot of people have lost their lives. A lot of people have lost loved ones to this tragic virus. So, you know, enjoy each moment you have with your loved ones. You know, extend the arm out to them when they need it. Check up on them as needed. And, you know, let's keep everybody safe. Um, you know, each week we're ha- you know happy to have our family here listening with us each and every week, tuning in, chiming in on the conversations. Um, you know, we're excited that, you know, on H- on HSRN, they're playing our old shows at 11 o'clock in the morning, so during this hour right now, and then in the evenings, I believe at 10 o'clock at night. So if you have uh, Sirius XM Radio and you have the H- HSRN uh, channel on there, give a listen to our old episodes as well. You can catch our other episodes as well on um, Apple Podcasts as well and uh, Spotify. Um and eventually, as Dr. Pitts has said in recent weeks, we'll also be moving to uh, HSRN Live, so be on the lookout for that. Um, we have an exciting conversation today. We're going to have some guest speakers as well today. Um, so, Jared, kick it off. Yeah, good morning, everybody. And as Ronnie said, we want to send our condolences to Dr. Lauren Pitts and her family. I'm just keep them in, in your prayers if you could. But we're definitely excited about today's show. We're going to hold it down for her and still give you guys that great energy that we do every week. Um, and with house talk pregame being on a whole different level, um, with all the raw times that we're living in right now, we're really delving into these issues, pulling topics from the HBCU landscape, and giving our experiences. And plus, like Ronnie said, some of the calling um, that calling from week to week, and we'll have some today. They'll give their experience. We'll be as transparent and truthful as we can. I'm looking to always give something back to the listeners out there. I'm going to provide some value. And we know some of you guys may be tired with things that are going on. And we know you guys care. And we're here for you guys. We have interest and the time to optimize. That'd be run. So, guys, um, we're going to have a very interesting and powerful conversation today. So, during our conversation, please call in with your questions and comments by simply dialing direct at 515-605-9744. Or email your HBCU shout outs, questions, or comments to hcpregame at gmail.com. So every week, me and Dr. Pitts do what we call the diagnosis of the week, where we talk about a mental health diagnosis and we give you the rundown on it, some symptoms, some uh, behaviors that are associated with the diagnosis, and some treatment options and resources. Um, so this week, I'll be holding it down. And for the diagnosis of this week, we'll be talking about schizophrenia. <clears throat> Schizophrenia is a serious mental illness that affects how a person thinks, feels, and behaves. People with schizophrenia may seem like they have lost touch with reality, which causes significant distress for the individual, their family, members, and friends. If left untreated, the symptoms of schizophrenia can be persistent and disabling. However, effective treatments are available. When delivered in a timely, coordinated, and sustained manner, treatment can help affect the individuals to engage in school or work, achieve independence, and enjoy personal relationships. <clears throat> so some of the symptoms of schizophrenia um, are as followed, and two or more of the following each present for a significant portion of time during a one-month period. Um, so basically, any of the symptoms that I'm about to list, if you've been experiencing them for at least one month actively, um, which are the first one is delusions, um, hallucinations, disorganized speech or frequent derailment or incoherence, grossly disorganized or canatonic behavior, meaning that they're in this kind of like stuck or standing still or kind of in a stupor, or negative symptoms such as diminished emotional expression or um, excitement for life. So typically oh, these will be active for at least one month 
over the course of at least six months. So continuous signs of disturbance persist for at least six months. This six-month period must include at least one month of symptoms that meet criterion A. So those are the symptoms that I just explained. It may include uh, periods of prodromal or residual symptoms, meaning reoccurring symptoms. During these prodromal or residual periods, the signs of disturbance may be manifested by only negative symptoms or by two or more symptoms listed in criterion A. Um, another criterion for to be diagnosed with schizophrenia is if schizoaffective disorder and other depressive or bipolar disorder with psychotic features have been ruled out because either one, no major depressive or manic episodes have occurred co-occurrently with the active phase symptoms, or two, if mood episodes have occurred during active phase symptoms, they have been present for a minority of the total duration of the active and residual periods of the illness. Um, the disturbance is not attributed to a psychological effect of the substance, meaning that this person who, who could have been abusing, let's say, maybe marijuana or uh, heroin or something like that, a psychoactive drug, they're not having a reaction from one of those, um, or a medical condition. And if there's a, a history of autism spectrum disorder or a communication disorder of childhood onset, the additional diagnosis of schizophrenia is made only of prominent delusions or hallucinations, in addition to the other required symptoms of schizophrenia are also present for at least one month. Meaning that so if a client is already um, diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder or any other type of communication disorder, typically they'll have an increase or more frequent uh, rate of having delusions or hallucinations, which schizophrenia will be tagged on alongside those diagnoses. So there are some current risk factors attributed with schizophrenia, um, number one being genetics. Um, there are some research that shows that um, – Schizophrenia can be passed down through families. However, even if a loved one is diagnosed with schizophrenia, that does not mean that they'll pass it down to their uh, children or offspring or anything like that. Um, environment also plays a role in schizophrenia. Um, typically, individuals who live in poverty, stressful surroundings, and exposures to viruses or nutritional problems before birth are typically uh, more likely to develop schizophrenia. Um, and also brain structure and function. Scientists think that the differences in brain structure, function, and interactions among chemical messengers called neurotransmitters may contribute to the development of schizophrenia. For example, differences in the volume of, of specific components of the brain in the way regions of the brain are connected to work together in uh, neurotransmitters such as dopamine are found in people with schizophrenia. Differences in brain connections and brain circuits seen in people with schizophrenia may begin developing before birth. Changes to the brain that occur during puberty may trigger psychotic episodes in people who are vulnerable due to genetics, environmental exposures, or the types of brain dif differences mentioned above. Um, and one thing, and one key thing to note that I forgot to mention at the beginning: typically, you will not see the onset of schizophrenia for somebody until they're in their late teens, early 20s. So, typically, when a child is going off to college, um, that is a very, you know, that's a, a life-changing moment right there. That's a, a life-altering moment. So typically when you have that change, you know, that could start to begin to really um, enhance those signs and symptoms of schizophrenia. So what are some treatments and uh, resources for uh, schizophrenia? So the first thing is medication. And medication is probably one of the most important things for schizophrenia. Because like I said, schizophrenia affect, uh, affects the brain and neurotransmitters. So antipsychotic anti medications such as Seroquel, Abilify, which are pill forms, can be taken, or let's say a client who has schizophrenia might not be uh, consistent or be, uh, can be accountable to take their pills, can take injections such as Invega or Geodon, which gives them the same medication but in injection form. Um, and some clients actually prefer to have injections as opposed to having the hassle of dealing with pills. Um, psychosocial treatment such as cognitive behavioral therapy, behavior skills training, Supported employment and cognitive remediation interventions may help address the negative and cognitive symptoms of schizophrenia. Usually a, a combination of these therapies alongside with medication is the common way we treat people with schizophrenia. Um, family education and support is very important, too. Um, like I said earlier, having a, a loved one or a family member with schizophrenia can be very taxing, it's very challenging, and it can also be very difficult to uh, be around that person on a day-to-day -day basis. So there are education programs or classes. There are workshops to help families gain better understanding of schizophrenia, 
the treatment options and the resources available to them. Um, and as well, so here are some things you can do to help your loved one who's going through schizophrenia. Uh, first and foremost, help them get treatment and encourage them to stay in treatment. Um, if the treatment begins to work, you know, definitely encourage them and give them that support to continue with treatment if they can't do it themselves. Remember that their beliefs or hallucinations seem very real to them, and that might be the most difficult thing to process as a, a person who doesn't have schizophrenia and has a loved one who has it, is that their thoughts, their hallucinations, their, their gestures, they believe they're real. Um, and when we talk about psychosis, psychosis is when what that person deems real isn't real. So when they're going through that psychotic state, is you know, is, is very crucial to remember as that caregiver that what they're going through is real to them, and you just have to stay consistent in your resources and treatments to help that person. Tell them that you acknowledge that everyone has the right to see things their way and be respectful, supportive, and kind without tolerating dangerous or inappropriate behaviors. Um, and remember, um, um, some symptoms require immediate emergency care. If your loved one is thinking about harm one, harming themselves or others or attempting suicide, please seek help right away by calling 911 or visiting your nearest emergency room and call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline or text the crisis uh, text line. All right. Back to you, Jared, for our HBCU shout-outs of the week. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I honestly didn't even know the exact, like, diagnosis or um, background on schizophrenia, so that definitely was some knowledge that I gained right there. I I was unaware. Um, So we appreciate that. And and as we do every week, we got to shout out our HBCUs as uh, we are HBCU alums. My school called Ronnie with um, Virginia State. And today I'm shouting out to um, the first one is Voorhees College. And Voorhees College is a private historically black college in Denmark, South Carolina. It was founded in 1897 by Elizabeth Evelyn Wright as the industrial school for African Americans. I mean, it was molded on the well-known Tuskegee Institute of Alabama's campus. And the first classes were held on the second floor of an old store. So they definitely had very, very humble beginnings. Um, In 1902, Ralph Voorhees, a New Jersey philanthropist, gave the school a donation to purchase land and construct buildings. Two years later, the Carolina General Assembly renamed the school and incorporated it as Voorhees Industrial Institute for Colored Youth. So that's how they got their their start with the uh, philanthropist Ralph Voorhees. Um, in 1924, the school's name changed to Voorhees School and Junior College, and the school became fully accredited in 1962 with the addition of a four-year curriculum, and that's when it became Voorhees College. It competes in the NAIA. Um, the men's sports, they include baseball, basketball, cheerleading, cross-country, track and field. The women's sports include volleyball, track and field, softball, cross-country, cheerleading, and basketball. Um, A notable alumni is Jackie Dinkins. He was a former Chicago Bulls player. He played with them from 1971 to 1972, and he was drafted in the ninth round of the NBA draft. Of course, now we know it's uh, two two rounds in the NBA draft, so definitely um, are proud of that to have an alumni in the NBA. My second school is Jarvis Christian College. Um, Jarvis Christian College is a Christian Historically Black College in Wood County, Texas. It was founded in 1912. Um, It is currently the only historically black college which still remains of the 12 founded by the Disciples of the Church. Um, The school started originally as a school for the youth with the early ages as elementary school. So they started off as a school for youth elementary school. They eventually grew into high school and they also um, had a junior college portion as well. And in 1928, the school became incorporated as a full college, four-year university. Um, They also compete in the NAIA as well. Um, Their men's sports include golf, basketball, track, bowling, and soccer. It's very rare to have, you know, golf and soccer on HBCU campus. I think I've only seen it twice. uh, Shout outs. And then for women, they have soccer, volleyball, bowling, and cross country. And for the alumni I searched, I could not find notable alumni on there. Um, I kept coming up with alumni associations, but I didn't find anybody that was a notable alumni. I know they're out there. They just, you know, they just don't want to see the HBCU shine. But, uh, Ronnie, you got the next uh, 
Shout out. Come on, Google. That's the second school we've done where you ain't, ain't highlighted these alumni. So, all right. At all. So, the first school I'll be doing is Clark Atlanta University, located in Atlanta, Georgia. So, Clark Atlanta uh, is a comprehensive, private, urban, co-educational institution of higher, educa- higher education with a predominantly African-American heritage. It offers undergraduate, graduate, and professional degrees, as well as certificate programs to students of diverse racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic backgrounds. The university was established in 1988 through the consolidation of its two parent institutions, Atlanta University, which was founded in 1865, the nation's first institutional award graduate degree to African Americans, and Clark College in 1869, the nation's first four-year liberal arts college to serve a primarily African American student population. As I said, Atlanta University was founded in 1865 by the American Missionary Association, with subsequent assistance from the Freedoms Bureau, uh, was before consolidation of the nation's oldest graduate institution serving a predominantly African American student body. By the late 1870s, Atlanta, Univer- Atlanta University had begun granting bachelor's degrees and supplying black teachers and librarians to public schools across the South. Clark College was founded in 1869 as Clark University by the Freedom's Aid Society of the Methodist Episcopal Church, which later will become the United Methodist Church. The university today uh, celebrates its historic bond with the denomination. Clark University was named for Bishop Davis W. Clark, who was the first president of the Freedom's Aid Society and uh, became bishop in 1864. The first Clark College class was housed in a separately furnished room in Clark Chapel, a Methodist Episcopal Church in Atlanta Summer Hill section. In 1871, the school relocated to a newly purchased property at Whitehall and McDaniel Street. In 1877, the school was chartered as Clark University. For the purposes of of, uh, economy and efficiency, during the late 1930s, it was decided that Clark would join the Atlanta University complex. In 1957, the controlling boards of six institutions, Atlanta University, Clark College, Morehouse College, Morris Brown College, Spelman College, and Gammon Theological Seminary ratified new articles of, of affiliation to create the Atlanta University Center, the most prevalent consortium of African-American private institutions of higher education in the, in the United States. During the 1980s, some of the advantages of proximity, which had seemed promising earlier, again became evident. Clark College and Atlanta University, through consolidation, preserved the best of the past and present and charted a bold new future. Clark Atlanta University was created on July 1, 1988. Hmm. Some alumni include James Weldon Johnson, who was one of the early leaders of the NAACP, Eva Marcel, DJ Drama, Kenya Bears, who is the creator of Blackish, Grownish, Nixedish, um, Bobby Valentino, and Mace. Mm, Mace. So the second, that. yeah, that was that was a lot of history right there. That was a lot a lot of fat. It was fascinating reading it how it started too. Yeah. Um, the second school I'll be doing is Elizabeth City State University, located in, uh, located in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Uh, Elizabeth City State University is part of the uh, CIAA conference, um, which also houses schools like Virginia State, Bowie State, um, Shaw, and uh, many others. On March 3rd, 1981, Hugh Kale, an African-American representative in the North Carolina General Assembly from Pasquotank County, sponsored House Bill 383, which established a normal teaching school for teaching and training teachers of the colored race to teach in the common schools of North Carolina. The bill passed and the the origin of Elizabeth State University was born. The the institution's first name was Elizabeth City State Colored Normal School. The institution was elevated from a two-year normal school to a four-year teacher's college in 1937. Two years later, the institution name was officially changed to Elizabeth City State Teachers College. The growth and elevation of Teachers College changed the mission to include training elementary school principals for rural and city schools. The first, the first Bachelor of Science degrees in elementary education were awarded in May of 1939. In 1963, 
The, the North Carolina General Assembly changed the institution's name from Elizabeth City State Teachers College to Elizabeth City State College in 1963, and then on July 1st, 1969, the college became Elizabeth City State University. Over the years, the university fared well among publications that rank institutions. Elizabeth City State has earned a national acclaim for its advancements. U.S. News and World Report uh, ranked ECSU number seven among top public schools, number 14 among top performers in social mobility, number 22 among top, top HBCUs, and number 36 amongst best regional colleges. Washington mm-hmm. Monthly ranked uh, Elizabeth City State number 11 for best bang for your buck colleges this, just this past year. Uh, alumni include uh, Larry Johnson, who is the current assistant head coach for Ohio State University, and Alex Haley, who is the writer for the book Roots. And that was my shout out for the week. Back to you, Jared. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. And we're going to jump into the show today. We have a very, very good show, interesting topic, um, powerful. I think, you know, this is something that anyone who thinks of HBCU, this is probably the first thing that you think of. And we're going to talk about the dilemma between should I pledge and if so, what? So we're going to get into the benefits of pledging, pledging grabbers, undergrad, PWI versus HBCU. We'll have some callers um, chime in on their experience um, from from their pledging um, while they were at a HBCU. And, you know, me, myself, I did not pledge. I'll say that up front. Um, I had, I guess, opportunities to pledge. I had teammates around me who were pledging. Um, my football coach is a Q. Um, so, I mean, I was on HBCU. I couldn't get away from it. You know, I literally walk outside my dorm and I'm right on the capital plot. Um, so, it was definitely there. Um, never tried to put my foot into it, but I do have some um, experiences from teammates and, and just my experience from seeing it on a day-to-day basis. Um, and we're going to, you know, talk about you know, how that rubbed off on me. What is my take on it? What did I see as a benefit? Things like that. Um, Ronnie's going to give his take on it as well. Um, and I'll just say for me, I'll just be straight up and say I didn't see any reason for me to join um, because I was on a football team. And, you know, a fraternity is looked at as a brotherhood or a sisterhood if it's a sorority. And football was my brotherhood. I'm at the time. And I just want to say a lot of the black fraternities, sororities, they arose in the early 1900s. Um, and it was during a time in American history where African Americans were socially abused and oppressed. Um, so with that being said, there's been some controversy as was that the actual reason why fraternities and sororities were established or was it you know, for a different reason? Is it really an asset to the black community or is it not? So we're going to talk about all that and be transparent with it as well. Um, Ronnie, what's your take or your introduction um, to the fraternities and sororities and and what's your idea of them? So before I give my opinion on the uh, fraternities and sororities, uh, for for our uh, listeners who are, might not be familiar with all the uh, black fraternities and sororities, um, let me list them real quick for you. Um, they're typically called the Divine Nine. And the Divine Nine are, are nine historically black Greek letter organizations that make up the National Pan-Hellenic Council. Collectively, these organizations are referred to as the Divine Nine. Each of these uh, fraternities and sororities are rich in history. So the first one is Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, which was founded in 1906 on the campus of Cornell University. Um, The first sorority I'll mention is Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, which was founded in 1908 on the campus of Howard University. Uh, The next fraternity is Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity, founded in 1911 on the campus of Indiana University. The next fraternity is Omega Psi Phi Fraternity, also founded in 1911 on the campus of Howard University. Uh, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, founded in 1913, also on the campus of Howard University. Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity, founded in 1914, also on Howard University's campus. Um, Zeta Phi Beta Sorority, founded in 1920, also on the campus of Howard University. 
Sigma Gamma Rho sorority founded in 1922 on the campus of Butler University. And last but not least, Iota Phi Theta fraternity founded in 1963 on the campus of Morgan State University. Um, so me and uh, Jared were talking before the show started. And so I told Jared that when I was an undergrad, I had expressed interest to uh, Mega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. Um, I had a lot of um, I had a lot of friends who also expressed interest. A lot of teammates who are, who are already currently um, uh, cues at that point. And so, you know, I had expressed interest into a mega sci-fi. And for me, one of the things that I just had a hard time personally getting over was just um, the fact of you know some of the things that you know fraternities do to members who are expressing interest and you know wanting to join their fraternity um we'll get on we'll get into more of those details as the show goes on um i believe we have a, a caller at this point uh jared you said you have a caller coming in yeah mr ed Wright. um he's going to be joining us today as well um he's a Bowie state alum and he's actually a q um mr ed Wright, can you hear us i can can you hear me okay yeah, definitely, definitely. What um chapter um did you pledge? If I said that right, I pledged it. Yeah, at Epsilon Sigma chapter, which is uh at Bowie State University, uh, right okay. here in Bowie, Maryland. And uh, so yeah, I actually uh, joined the organization back in 1985. I went to Bowie State from Washington D.C. as a high school graduate to go work mm-hmm. on my degree. Really, nobody in my family had ever been in a fraternity that I knew of or recognized. And I went on campus, and, you know, you see the Greek life and all the letters and all that. And so my first year, I just kind of observed what these brothers were doing, and I saw the different ones. And and a lot of the, the ones that I kind of were uh, associating with just happened to be brothers that, that happened to be in Omega. And some of my friends uh, did it before me, and they were already guys I was hanging, not because of what they were doing, but just really simply because uh, what they were about, they just seemed more like me. And, uh, and then in, you know, 1985, I decided to pursue the organization and, 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 and actually get initiated in. And, uh, and, and I did go through the process of, of what, you know, at that time, uh, there's the initiation process. I went through whatever the, you know, the, the, the program was at that time. And, uh, it was at, at that time it was about two weeks on, on campus. And, okay. uh, so I enjoyed the 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 the, the uh, connection with a, a body of brothers who, uh, based right. on the surface, were about the like uh, attainments of manhood scholarship, perseverance, and uplift on those principles, which happened mm-hmm. to kind of resonate with me. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, so that's why so you- I chose that particular organization over another one, even though mm-hmm. they all do the same thing or have same serv- you know service level goals and and and, and those level of things, but. Uh, mm-hmm. I just resonated with those particular brothers on that campus, and they just happened to be Omegas. Okay, got you, got you. We appreciate gotcha. that. We're gonna we're gonna come back to you because we wanna I wanna ask you some questions um, about your experience. So we have another caller. Um, one second, caller one three nine eight. Uh, welcome to the House Talk pregame. Um, what comments or questions did you wanna share uh, with everyone? Well, first of all, good morning, and um, I want to thank you guys for, you know, having this conversation about um, HBCUs and Greek life and things of that nature, because <laughs> it's something that needs to be talked about more. Um, me, personally, I'm a member of Omega South Five Fraternity Incorporated um, through the New South Chapter at Virginia State. Um, I did call us a little bit later, so I'm spring 15, um, so my initiation might have been a little bit different from the brother who spoke before me. Um but I will say, um, you know, it's not really much about the stereotype. I think we get wild up in the stereotypes of fraternities and sororities. It's more about the values that you stand on and, like um, the brother said before me, what resonates with you personally. Um, you know, I think, you know, the, the, the motto, friendship is, is essential to the soul, is a mega size motto. And, you know, that resonated with me, you know, um, mm-hmm. just based on, true friendship, and like you said, brotherhood. Um, I play football as well, but the thing about football is it is a brotherhood, but football only lasts for so long. you got to hang the cleats up one day. So, you know, 
Um, mm-hmm. Joining Omega Sci Fi was something that is a lifetime thing. Um, you know, you expect me to be, you know, active, a financial brother for the duty of your life. So, you know, it's really important to me um, that, you know, we kind of change the conversation about, you know, fraternities and sororities and them being so negative to the black culture because when you mm-hmm. think about the history and the origin of these organizations, um, the purpose of it was to advance, you know, opportunities for black people. So mm-hmm. when we get back to that, to the root of the history, um, I think that, you know, kind of changes people's perspective a little bit rather than just seeing it on social media or, you know, um, step in and stroll and things of that nature. That seems to bring the interest. But when you look at the heart of the organization, it's more about, you know, the service, the advancing opportunities. Like we have mandated programs that we have to do every year that people don't know about, um, voter registration, NAACP, things of that nature. So it's, it's bigger than just stepping and strolling and being on social media and things. It's not a social club at all. So um, right. that's my skill. Yeah, no, no, I appreciate that. I, I definitely appreciate that. What was, So what would you say, like, was the thing that really drew you in? I know you mentioned the brotherhood and things like that. Was there anything deeper? Because I know, like, before I went to HBCU, I saw movies, you know, Stop the Yard, you know, all those movies. Right. And, you know, that's what you expect, you know what I'm saying, to go on to the HBCU camp. And that's what draws a lot of people in, you know, what they see on TV, things right. like that. So was there anything specific when it was like the light bulb went off in your head, like, I have to do this. I have to be a part of this. Well, um, my first cousin is a member of Omega Sci Fi, but, mm. um, you know, that has an influence, but it wasn't the most significant influence. When I um, came to the campus of Virginia State University, like I said, I played football. Two of my captains were members of Omega Sci Fi. So, you know, I just like the way that the, the brothers on my campus, they carry themselves, you know, we dress up, we do, you know, work in the community. Um, we had members of SGA, Student Government Association, things like that. So it was, you know, it just resonated with me. You know, I thought I aligned with that. You know, my values were kind of aligned with the, their values as well. And, you know, just seeing them do good things and kind of – I say the new side is a little bit different from the other fraternities on the yard. Just like I said, we're more business like, we dress up more. You know, kinda of help me, you know, form into a professional at a young age. So okay. that's what I enjoy the most. Yeah. Nice. And you and um our other guest for today, Mr. Ed Wright. So y'all both played football and either one of you guys can go first, but um we can go back to um uh, Mr. Mr. Ed. How was it pledging and being a part of a football team, how is that balanced? What, can you explain that? You both can, you know, chime in on that. Uh, I can jump in. I, I did play. And uh, the difference for me at the time was I was not on scholarship. So mm-hmm. it, it was a little different. So that I didn't have an obligation to where they could actually leverage me that way. Um, no way. But the fortunate thing for me was that we pledged in the spring. So we were initiated in the spring of the year, like, in, in March, April time. So we went over in March. So it was between January and let's say March. Football season was already over. So the only thing it really interrupted or put a stress on me for was doing the uh, off season workouts, which was a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. Gosh, gotcha, gosh. Gotcha. How about you? Um, now, uh, yes. Mr. Wright, real quick, uh, I know you said you had pledged during the spring and you weren't necessarily a scholarship player. Um, were you were you a starter at the time, or if you were a starter at the time, did it make maybe your responsibilities as a, a leader of the football team um, was that time management a, a little bit more difficult, or due due to it being in the spring, it made it a little bit more manageable? Well, actually, I did not have a, a captain role on the football team at the time. I was a starter. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, so it did, you know, affect study time and things like that to, in preparation for the upcoming season. But it was only for a short duration of time, so it really didn't affect me directly. And I I know some brothers who actually did the process while they were playing football. And mm-hmm. that is a lot more challenging. Yeah, I, w- I would agree with that. Um Daryl, um, your turn. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about your experiences of uh, when you were pledging and playing football. I think you also crossed during the spring as well, right? Right, spring 15. Yeah. Um, so I was actually a sophomore in college. So I did start as well. I was a starter on the football team. It was a little bit early until, you know, my tenure in, in undergrad. So 
I didn't have as many, as much, you know, responsibilities um, in terms of leadership on the football team, but I did, you know, contribute, um, as you know, you know, we were teammates. But um, <laughs> yeah. I would say, um, you know, pledging in the spring, um, it's kind of not easier, but it's less, you know, it's a less impact on the football season because it's a spring ball, honestly. Um, and when you have coaches that kind of, when you let your coaches know and you're transparent with them, about what's going yeah. on, things of that nature, you know, um, that tends to help out a little bit, you know, in regard to um, them just having an understanding of what's going on. You might be, you not might, you might not be your sharpest, you know, um, things of that nature. So, I think it's all about just being transparent and um, with your coaching staff because you can't tell everybody, but um, at least your coaching staff, um, you know, and then as well as having the time management skills to say, okay, I need to take care of this first. You know, let me knock this out the way. Let me do my homework in between, you know, this time, my leisure time, you know, because I know I have other obligations. So um, it's really about time management and, you know, just organizing your time. <clears throat> Got you. And, um, and Dara, um, so um, when you had played spring 15, um, you know, as we kind of talked about earlier, you know, as far as expressing interest and things like that, typically people express interest, you know, well before they actually start the pledging process. Um, and when right. you're talking about mentioning to your coach, mentioning to coaches, our head coach during that last football season in 2014 was also a cue as well. Um, so did you? So when you were expressing interest in things like that, did you uh, talk to uh, our former coach, Coach Scott, about uh, wanting to pledge Omega South by? Well, at the time I did, I did not because you know discretion. You have to be very careful who you share that type of information with, um, and that's a note Got for you. those who may be listening. You know. You know, if you feel like you want to express interest, make sure you keep it to yourself or, you know, the ones that you trust the most because you can't share that information with everybody because that could, you know, hurt your chances of joining the organization. But, Ronnie, if you remember, um, spring 15 is when Coach Three came in. Um, so we had yeah. a whole new coaching staff when I was president. And, you know, Coach Hanson, who was my uh, position coach at the time, he was against fraternities, all fraternities and sororities. He was thinking he had the same understanding of fraternities as like, Football is your only brotherhood. You should be focused on football. You know, I was on a scholarship, so, you know, I had obligations for football. But at the same time, I didn't let that, you know, interfere with my, you know, performance in the season time. Now, for the spring, I might have been a little off for the spring. I will be the first to admit that because it's kind of hard. It, it, it's really tough um, to do both at the same time. But, you know, um, I did share it with my head coach, and, you know, he knew about what was going on. So he knew if I was a little bit more tired. I was exhausted, you know, these were the reasons why. And a couple of my line brothers were football players as well. So it, it was an understanding on the football team, you know, of from the head coach standpoint that, you know, these guys are going through something right now. So, you know, let's be a little bit more empathetic and understanding of what they have going on. Um, but at the same time, you still have to uphold your football, you know, expectations because you're on scholarship. So you don't want to lose your money. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's what you're at school for. Absolutely. So. <laughs> I feel you on that. And that was one of the things, because um, when you had crossed spring of 15, that was the uh, – that summer before was the year I had actually expressed interest into um, Omega Sci Fi. And one of the things um, that I had struggled with was what you talked about was the time management and balancing, you know, football, academics, and, you know, also expressing interest and, you know, trying to network with the, the cues that were on campus and the older ones. Um, right. That was something me personally that I had struggled with was that time management. And, you know, for me, going into that senior year, I had, you know, had a heavy course load. And that was one of the things that I had to make that decision on was, am I going to, you know, sacrifice school or football to, you know, right. join a fraternity? Or will I have to, you know, be like, well, you know, this is just something that, that I myself know I can't handle the time management of doing this. So I'm going to have to, you know, in this right here. Um, so that was, I'm glad that you spoke on that. Mm -hmm. Right. It's good. It can be very taxing. <laughs> yeah. Now I think like, I think there's definitely an elephant in the room when it comes to fraternities, when it comes to sororities and things like that. Um, and I know both of you guys mentioned in your experience, the brotherhood was, if not the thing that led you to joining the organization, but it was a, a, a pivotal, um, you know, point. And for me, and we can go back to the football thing because I found my brotherhood in football versus finding my brotherhood in a fraternity. And I had several teammates who pledged um, cues, 
Um, we had alphas. I think we had one kappa. Um, my head coach was a Q. You know what I'm saying? So, and I've met guys on the team that very cool guys, cool guys that I respect, guys that I don't have any issue with, like very down to earth, genuine, good people that pledged in these fraternities. But then you also have these guys that, and they were, this is what rubbed me the wrong way. If they never had a purple shirt on, if they never had a red shirt on, a black and gold shirt on, there was nobody, they was losers, there was lames on campus. And once they get that shirt, then they feel like they got the the audacity to feel like they're bigger than you, better than you, talk to you any way they want, look at you any way they want, walk on campus with their chest out. And that's the part of being a part, part of a fraternity. And I've seen it in sororities as well that I just couldn't get along with, that I just didn't vibe with. And while we're talking about brotherhood, when I look at a brotherhood from my real friends or my real, you know, my teammates that I look at as brothers or my biological brother, a brotherhood to me, I don't tear down. I don't dehumanize any of them. I constantly lift them up. And what I started to see and, you know, heard from other people's experiences was it seemed like there was a lot of dehumanizing going on behind closed doors. And that's what I couldn't get with. And that's why I never wanted to join because I felt I'm not about to be less of a man, you know, and be treated poorly by another man. So what's your guys take on that? Um, I, I agree. I agree did you want to speak first, brother? I, I, I'll jump in on that. I agree with okay. the brother 100%. Uh, I, I, I hear you because it's a, I felt that too because uh, I had heard all the stories, but I didn't know. I was just saying, you know, you got to go through something. And it's going to be not easy and, you know, this kind of thing. But I didn't actually know what it was. It was it was just, yeah, they're going to make sure that you fit, you know, that kind of thing. And mm-hmm. so I, I, I do agree that, the, that there were some things that may have happened that I, I see even at 56 years old now that they had no relevance to anything in brotherhood or whatever the case may be. However, there were some concepts I think that were basic things that were supposed to be infused on that initiation process with your line brothers was to build unity, uh, collaborative effort where you guys share ideas and come up with something for the greater cause. Nobody's greater than the other person. The things that you were seeing, my brother, exuded are true because they are brothers who uh, wear shirt, don't do no work, but yet they get all the credit for what the organization does and they clap for those things. But then they're not out there in the forefront when it, when when it's when it's time for the the organization to represent itself the way it's supposed to be, mm-hmm. uh, and, and to take it to a life situation, man. Just like you were talking about, my brother, when you too much what a real brother looks like is when you're on your deathbed. It ain't about how high you can step, how many spins you can do. None of that is where are you? Are you talking to that brother's wife and his children right now? Mm-hmm. Right. Where is your heart right now when you're supposed to be a brother, when my, my brother's keeper, when he can't keep his family and he can't keep his wife and his wife's frustrated and in and, 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 and pain? Where are you? I'll tell you, I've been to some hospitals where a brother was on his deathbed and some of them same brothers that said they were super cues, mm-hmm. they were nowhere to be found. But the ones that didn't want to, you know, they, they were the brothers that was doing the work. They weren't the ones that were the most seen. They were the ones that right. were exemplifying the brotherhood of the fraternity in times of need. Okay. Nice. Right. And just to piggyback off that, you know, everybody's a different person, you know, before they get those three letters. Like, you know, three letters shouldn't change you as a person. And, and we oftentimes see it happen a lot. And, you know, and you said a lot of factual things. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, you're you're a man before you had those three letters and you're a man after you have them. So the way you carry yourself is is your obligation, you know? Um, some people get a sense of entitlement from it, but I feel like me, myself, just speaking on myself, personally, you know, I was the same person before and after, and I think Ronnie can attest to that. Um, I didn't change one bit. And, you know, um, as far as the dehumanizing piece, um, I'm just going to give a, a relation to football. You know, we go through training camp. You know, it's not the best part of the year, you know, like we may feel like, why am I doing this? Like, why does coach have me? You may feel like coach is dehumanizing you, but it's all for a greater 
you know, common goal um, for mm-hmm. the season. So I feel like every – I won't go too in-depth in detail about, you know, the initiation process, but every every um, experience served a purpose. Like, it was a lesson in, in each experience that, you know, I've experienced, what I've went through. Um, there's a lesson in everything. So um, I think it's just mm-hmm. having that mindset that we're here for a common goal. You know, it's not that I'm a less, less of a man than you. It's kind of that, mm-hmm. you know, somebody's breaking you down to build you up even stronger, you know. And a lot of the things that I've learned during my initiation process, I can translate into life as a professional right now, um, in life as a human, as a as a citizen in the community. Like, it all translates. So, um, you know, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, though. So. Yeah, no, I appreciate nah, you for the response. Did you have something to say, Ronnie? Yeah, I was going to uh, – uh, comments to what Daryl was saying, and I would definitely attest to Daryl that you know, I knew, of course, I knew Daryl before he had uh, played as Omega, and I, I've had the opportunity and the chance to get to know him even better afterwards. And I can say that you know, he has not changed as a man, you know, before and after. And I would also like to think that you know, all of our teammates who became uh, Q's d- during our time in college, they also didn't change from who they were before they pledged. And I think, I think a lot of that, and Daryl, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, a lot of that I, I feel like attributes to you already being, you know, your own man as a football player and our right. other teammates who are going to be this football players. Like we already had an identity established, you know, you're a football player, you're a scholar athlete and things like that. Um, and, and you can attest to this better than I can. Unfortunately, there were some, you know, uh, individuals in uh, the new side chapter of, uh, of Omega Sci-Fi who, you know, I knew them before, you know, they had crossed as well. And after they crossed, you know, you, you see a complete 180 in their character and their behaviors. And and it could right. be, you know, that, you know, they got those letters, they got those colors on them, and they actually right. had an identity for once. They actually felt like they stood out and they were actually recognized, you know, for something that they may have thought was who they are, but, you know, they had to maybe, you know, sacrifice their morals or something like that in order to, you know, reach this level of attention and appreciation that they couldn't exactly. get just being themselves. Um, right. And that's not I, and that's not the case with every single person, like you, like both you gentlemen said. Um, for me, like, I, I know a lot of great men who are Qs, a lot of great men who are Kappas, Alphas, and things like that. There are a lot of great men in those uh, fraternities and things like that, and sororities as well. And um, I think it's kind of like, you know, uh, like Mr. Wright was saying, as far as football goes, as the brotherhood, you know, there were some players on the football team who literally just were on a team to have a jersey and to sit there and say, yeah, I was part of the football right. team. Right. Daryl, you know this very well. Even on our championship team in 2014, you know, right. there were quite a few individuals who had no business being on the team. And honestly, we only had them on the team because we needed players for practice. And, you know, so, but they got rings. Right. You know, and I, well, I think all four of us can kind of agree to that. You know, there were yeah, players on teams that you just had because of practice. You know, you needed practice players. And, you know, no offense to them, but that's just, that was their role. They had a role to serve. Role, right. um, but they got sides for rings at the end of the season just like me and Daryl did. So, you know, right. I, I think both of your points are, are, are very true and, and very, um, very foresighting as well. Yeah, because like, what, what, yeah. go ahead. You know, I, was just add, I, I just wanted to add this, and, and he was speaking to this uh, uh, just now. Um, men, as far as our fraternity and any of the rest of them, uh, men, are make, men make Omega, Omega doesn't make men. Make and so That's you third. come to what you were, who you are is who you are. Now, right. unfortunately, even though those guys go through the process and get a shirt, and get initiated, mm-hmm. and they actually on the books of the fraternity. The, the, some of those guys still don't sometimes represent what it's about and the work that needs to be done, and all of those things don't get measured and they don't get checked internally within the fraternity with those brothers. Right. So that's, that's another area. So what you're seeing should not be necessarily recognized by somebody who's not in our fraternity. We should have recognized it too. Hey, bro, you walk around here like you, you, why'd you speak to him like that? You ain't no right. better than him. So when we don't check that behavior, it, 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 it permeates and makes our, it represents our organization in the wrong way. And, so, and we may have great men like yourself uh, who say, I would want to be a part of that organization that Charles Drew was in. Or that same organization that Michael Jordan is in. Why? Because I see the value. But 
for you not to want to do it because you see somebody else not represented in the proper way is not good for fratern- any fraternity or sorority. And I think right. sometimes we have to check the people that's within the membership. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And but that's that makes a good point. It's all about policing each other, you know, mm-hmm. and that's, that's part of what a brother, being a brother is, you know, whether it's biological brother or uh, brother-in-law, you know, you want somebody that's around you that's, you know, going to police you and correct you when you're wrong and help you out and uplift you. So I think mm-hmm. that's what it's about. Yeah, definitely. This, so, is, this is definitely um, our conversation. One second, Ronnie. Um, just want to, for the listeners out there, if anyone else has any questions or comments, feel free to call direct 515-605-9744. Feel free to chime in on the conversation. But go ahead, Ronnie, what were you about to say? Thank you for that, Jared. Um, so, Daryl, uh, real quick question, and um, I, and I definitely want to hear your viewpoint on this, and uh, Mr. Wright as well. So, uh, Daryl, like myself, is also in the mental health field. Um, he's a social worker, um, has his master's degree from uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, so, Daryl, um, as far as the mental health aspect of, you know, joining a fraternity and pledging and things like that, um, for you personally, tell us how it was on your mental health and did it affect your mental health at all? And then have you come across any of your brothers in the fraternity or other fraternities who have had their mental health affected by pledging or, you know, whether it was positive or negative? Right. So you bring up a good point. I was actually 19 years old when I um, joined the organization. So, you know, I was still finding myself, my identity, things of that nature in that developmental stage right there. Um, but I will say, you know, it, it, it taught me a lot of resilience um, and character, you know, and, the, and those are things that you can take to life and they translate to your daily living activity, activities. Um, you know, of course, it was overwhelming. Um, you know, I got school, I got the fraternity and football. So, you know, those three things can be overwhelming at times where when you kind of step back and kind of partialize and, you know, prioritize, that's what it's all about. It's about time management. So if you don't, if you lack time management skills, I'm, I'm sure that your experience may be a little bit different than mine. Um, I didn't feel myself slipping into like a crisis or anything like that, but I will say it was definitely tough. It was a tough period of life, Um, but it's helped me um, in my adult living life now. So, um, you know, it can be taxing on your mental, um, you know, just doing all those things at one time. So, you know, like I said, it's all about time management and, you know, how you are with that, how effective you are with with that mm-hmm. aspect. Yeah, definitely. So now y'all and y'all um, both sound y'all are like really, you know, upstanding, you know, gentlemen, you know what I'm saying? That's representing um Omega. Um, so I, I definitely do appreciate um that as well. And you know, like I said, we, we on this show, we're transparent. We share our opinions and, you know, respect each other's opinions. And, you know, my side of the story is just coming from how I saw brotherhood on the football field and things like that. But don't get me wrong, at homecoming, I was definitely on the queue plot for the uh, for the cookout. So. <laughs> <laughs> right there, because I, I, mean, I knew the guys that were doing the right thing, you know what I'm saying? And those were the people that I connected with you know, whether it's the Alpha, Kappa, or Q plot, and the guys that, you know, like we talked about where the letters just for the show, just for the girls, because we know if, if they didn't, they would not get any girls. But, you know, the same yeah. thing goes for football. If it was guys on the team that would just had a jersey on and were not there for the common goal of the team, I didn't have respect for them. You know, I respect them as a teammate, but as a person, morally, you can't respect them because they're doing something just for the benefit of it without putting the work in. So I'm not saying I look at a flat any different than I look at a football team. You know what I'm saying? So that's, you know, you know how I'm coming at it. And I think there's good, there's there's great benefits. Um, you know, if somebody does join a frat and they can benefit, um, you know, you know, in a great way. What would you guys say is the most beneficial thing? Like, has it helped with networking? Um, maybe having resources that you wouldn't have if you were not a part of this. <laughs> Uh, as the elder statesman on here and have 35 years in the frat, I would say absolutely. <laughs> now, the, again, it goes to how you view it. And they're brothers that's my age that don't make no connections with anybody. They just only go to right. the parties when they t- 
tell them for Mardi Gras, and that's all they show up for. But yeah. the brothers who have looked at this and saw that there's some brothers in powerful positions, they're brothers in the military. Like a lot of my military brothers have found that they've been in, in commands where the general of, of that command, the top person, mm-hmm. was a Q. And because of mm-hmm. discretion and, and the relationship, and they not even just because you're in that organization, they're at that general's house for the cookout. Mm-hmm. Now at work, you know, it, everything is on the surface is the way it's supposed to be. I ain't saying nobody giving somebody some extras, but mm-hmm. when that's on your resume. And it happens to be a Q reading that resume and everything being equal between you and somebody else, mm-hmm. I think you get denied. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it does right. have value from a networking standpoint and being able to know people and people helping to, to progress your career. Not that you ain't able to do the work. You have mm-hmm. to be in position properly to be able to get that. But sometimes it may right. take a push from somebody that's internal to, to make that thing happen for you. Right. And I totally agree, brother. Um, you know, it's about how you apply yourself, honestly. If, if you're engaged, if you're active, um, you're more likely to seek out members who may be on different platforms or have different resources for you. Um, personally speaking, my boss is a member of Omega Sapphire. He's actually in my chapter. So that was a way that I um, kind of made my way into a management management position at a younger age um, just through that connection. But at the same time, you still have to have the skills, the background, um, the credentials to be in those places. Um, but it's just about using your resources, reaching out to those brothers, building a relationship, bridging the gap between the old and, and, the, and the new. Um, mm-hmm. say. So um, it definitely mm-hmm. helps, though. <clears throat> right. Now, now I have a question for the listeners that are out there or that may listen later on. Um, that are unfamiliar, you know, maybe it's somebody who's going into college and maybe they're seeing interest in joining a, a frat or a sorority. What is it? Can you like break down what a chapter is? Okay. Yeah, so a chapter I, I, is, oh, well, go, ahead, yeah. go ahead, brother. I love that. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I, I guess the chapter is just where you're initiated at. Like um, every school has a different chapter and then, you know, you have grad chapters for the graduate level. Um, so a chapter is just your, essentially your home um, through Omega. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't know if brother can better explain it, but I, that's how I see it. Uh, just just to be where you cross that, where you are initiated through. Um, so it's just mm-hmm. like an element of the whole fraternity. Okay. And Mr. Wright, was that, did you want to add anything else to any listeners for the chapter, or is that pretty much the breakdown of yeah, right there? And and for for the folks out there that are are part of the body of Christ, for example, mm-hmm. there is a the, the body of Christ as a whole is a big thing, but everybody has their own home church. So mm-hmm. not that you don't fellowship other places. This is where you 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 your home is. This is where your community is. This is where you can be most effective in your role. Right. Okay. Got you. And and another thing, um, you know, education, when it comes to joining a fraternity or sorority, you know, I, of course, you know, like we mentioned, me and Ronnie, we haven't been in the in the trenches for anything um, of the pledging, but, you know, I've had a roommate who pledged and, you know, I, I never see him uh, four in the morning, he's out, things like that, tired, dragging, like Ronnie mentioned, I believe, you know, some of your teammates coming into practice dragging. How about how does it affect you on the education side? You know, if there's parents out there that, you know, maybe they don't come from a family where their brother, their sister, their mother pledged, how should they, from a standpoint of, okay, is my son or my daughter going to be able to still function playing football, going to school, making the marks to, to graduate with a certain GPA to set themselves up for college um, and pledge? Like, how? How do you guys see that um, relation? And did at any point, if you don't mind sharing, did you suffer any educationally or anything like that? I, I can jump um, on that question. Okay. I mean, me personally, uh, my grades did go down, uh, not not dramatically. Um, however, maybe I, let's say I had a three a three five the semester before. I might. I think I ended up having a, a three zero the semester mm-hmm. I played, a three two or something. So 
it, it did take some 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 element of that uh, away because of the, the, the change in schedule that was abrupt. It mm-hmm. wasn't like you didn't know you weren't able to plan for the schedule that you was going to get. Mm-hmm. So, so you weren't prepared, so you couldn't plan for it. So when it came, you had to make adjustments on the fly. Sometimes, if you weren't able to do it quickly enough, it could affect your grades. Now, I will say that as part of our process, there was a four-hour piece of time mm-hmm. that we were all in the library. Mm-hmm. There was no – you were together. The brothers was with you, but you had mm-hmm. your books. You had everything that you need to be studying. Now, did we – get to go to bed after that? Probably not. <laughs> but the opportunity to study was there. Now, whether you fell asleep during that time or you did something else, that was up to you. But if you, the opportunity was presented to you, so the, 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 the part of, of, of keeping your schoolwork up, a scholarship, was given mm-hmm. to you. But, it, again, it comes down to time management. Okay. And, Daryl, if you yeah. want to share your experience on that. Uh, just to piggyback off of that, um, you know, I had, you know, we had designated time for studying as well. Um, you now, everybody didn't utilize that time for exactly studying, but, you know, it's it's all on the individual. Um, you want to take a step back and think of the individual. Now, in this work ethic, if you have the work ethic to, you know, go to school, go to class, deal with the fraternity business, and 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 thrive, then you know that's that's you on an individual level, um, honestly. So I think it comes down to just the work ethic of the person. Um, of course, it's going to have an influence on your grades the semester of. Um, but I graduated with honors. You know, it didn't it didn't stop me from being a good student. You know, because that's what I was in school for, essentially. And you know, one of our cardinal principles is scholarship. So that's something that is, um, you know, promoted and enforced uh, throughout the whole initiation process. So. Um, you know, it all comes down to your work ethic and your time management skills. Right, right. So, uh, so gentlemen, I had a couple more questions to ask both of you all, but I wanted to start with this one first. Um, so, like I said earlier, you know, uh, both of you all's fraternity is part of what we would call the Divine Nine, um, which makes up the nine uh, African-American fraternities and sororities. So, um with everything that's been going on in 2020 and, you know, the emphasis on, you know, black Greek, uh, black Greek fraternities and sororities, you know, preserving, you know, their cultures and things like that. How do you both, how do both of you gentlemen feel about um, other uh, races expressing interest into your fraternities? And um, for, I know y'all can only speak for, you know, mega sci-fi, but how do you feel about that whole notion of other races, uh, wanting to uh, express interest in your uh, fraternity. Uh, now, I'm gonna take you back uh, 25 years. <laughs> I, my answer okay. would be no. You got enough. There's enough organizations out there. No, nah, I don't want you to come in mind. Right. The Ted. The Ted at 56 says, "I'm look. I'm not. Ju- I'm not judging what you look like." I'm judging what you, what's inside you, and what you bring to the to enhance the, the growth of the organization and to preserve its legacy. So mm-hmm. that's how Ted yeah. sees it now. So it, it's it's what added value are you going to bring to this organization versus what you look like. Mm-hmm. So that's where I'm at yeah. today. Man, 25 years ago, I thought totally different about it. <laughs> I got you. Right. So, Daryl, how, you, you know, how do you feel about that? I mean, and since you know you're only, at, I believe, 25, 26 at this point, have, have you right. had any other uh, members of another race express interest to you during your undergrad years or even about maybe grad chapter Omega Sci Fi? Um, I haven't personally, um, you know, but I have a strong stance on this. Now, I'm a social worker, so, you know, I respect the dignity and worth of everybody. Like, I respect, you know, that everybody's culture and everybody's different, you know, but um, I feel like our organizations were, you know, the purpose of our organizations were to advance the opportunities for black people, you know. So I'm not the – I'm not going to say I'm against it, but, you know, I don't personally – it's kind of hard. It's hard to say, Ronnie. Honestly, um, it's more about like what value you bring to the fraternity. That's that's the mature answer. That is the mature answer. What value do you bring to the fraternity? However, you know, like the history just 
he speaks on a different level. Um, and I, I try to keep that, you know, close to my heart, you know, because it's all about diversity now and inclusion and things of that nature in this society. But, you know, some mm-hmm. things were just made for black people, you know, and and that's obviously that I don't want to get too deep in that. <laughs> right. And the, re- and the reason I the reason I asked both of you all about that is because in recent weeks we've had conversations about you know the gentrification of HBCUs, <clears throat> and right. uh, one of the you know one of the examples I've thrown out is like for for example Morgan State University where they used to have a, a white population of maybe one and three percent you know in the early 2000s, but within the last decade that has jumped up um, I think to like maybe 13 percent. And even, you know, HBCU right. like Howard, where, you know, Howard is like what right. we consider like one of the Mecca HBCUs. Even their, you know, uh, other race populations, including the white population, has doubled within the last decade. And so, you know, like you were saying, you know, when we talk about these things and, you know, the diversity, inclusion, and things like that, the conversations we're having, especially as mental health providers, however, you right. know, when you go to certain cities, they still have Chinatowns. They still have Little Italy. They still have German towns and things like that, you know. So when we talk about these cultures and these traditions that have been, you know, passed down through the generations of African Americans, I, I can definitely understand both points. You know, like Mr. Wright was saying, you know, I'm looking at what you bring to the fraternity, whereas Daryl, you know, I, I I really feel you on, you know, well, look, we got to keep some things for us, you know. Like, you know, they, everybody else wants to, you know, be included in what we got going on. Can't we have something for ourselves? And, you know, that I, I think that is a realistic, you know, idea or realistic stance to take on it is, you know, let's have something for us. You know, not knocking, right. you know, the other races. Because I, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I do feel like there has been a white person who has pledged Q before. Um, I don't know the specific chapter or anything like that, but I have seen videos right. of, mm-hmm. you know, Caucasian American hopping and things like that with a whole bunch of Qs around them, hyping them up. You know, and I know the other fraternities have had white people as well and things like that. I don't know about how many other races they've had in their fraternities, but I I feel both points. You know, I I think that is a conversation that needs to be had and needs to be understood, you know, so, you know, people can feel where y'all are coming from on that. Right. Can you clarify, Ronnie? Can I clarify? I just wanted to. Like, if I see your brother that. If I see a brother that is not of African American descent, I'm not going to um, dehumanize them or refrain from being a good brother to them because at the end of the day, uh, we play at the same fraternity. We took the same initiation, you know. So I have respect for that brother, but at the same time, you know, I just feel like you know certain things, you know, should be sacred to our community, and I'll just leave it there. Yeah, no. I, the, the one thing, just from a broader perspective, if I may jump in here. Um, if, if we look at what's going on in our in our country right now, we 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 talking about uh, racial divide and all these divisions. Not that I'm promoting and putting up a banner to say join my organization. However, if I, I, I see it as an opportunity, some if it's the right person. That's why I said, what are you bringing to the organization? So I do see that there there, there were people back in the '60s during the Civil Rights Movement who were white. There were people that were on the Underground Railroad that helped Harriet Tubman that were white. Now, they participated in the movement, and they had a good reason to be there. They had a purpose because they believed in what we believed in and the principles on what we stood for. So I do see if that that person has some reason to come in and – Maybe he can bring a different perspective on maybe his where he came from, his culture, to 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 share. Then then it could be conversations that we could take out into the community because we we're, we're selling we're sell, uh, settling that within our particular fraternity. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I, I guess I see it from a different pers- from that perspective. Uh, whereas also, what happens when you have a situation when we have multiracial couples who have mm. children. Now you have mm, Tiger right. Woods that shows up at, at Bowie State <laughs> and wants to play as Q. So what are we going to say to him? I mean, we are... I actually am a biracial, you know, makeup. So, you know, that was... I used to always... I don't know if I ever uh, said this joke to Daryl, but uh, one of my other good friends who uh, actually pledged uh, grad chapter, and, and Daryl knew who I'm talking about, but... um 
one of the things I had joked with him about was I was like, man, you know, if I go through with this, I could possibly be the chapter first white person and, you know, play as Q, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> you would definitely you know, so that, that is, you know, I think that is a very powerful <laughs> discussion. I don't know if, I don't know if y'all have those discussions during y'all's chapter meetings and things like that, but I think that right. is a very interesting topic and, you know, a very interesting conversation that definitely needs to be had, especially in today's climate. Um, and I just had one more question for both you gentlemen um, as far as, you know, both of you all players at an HBCU. So, um, how is that dynamic, you know, pledging at HBCU versus somebody who pledges at a PWI? Is the process any different? Is there any, like, inner fraternity, like, you know, like rivalry? Like, well, you know, you, well, you pledge at a PWI, I pledge at an HBCU, so the process was harder. Or, like, how, do, how does that work, you know, with, with the different chapters and things like that? I, I'm, I'm gonna defer to the young brother. I close. I, I answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, Ronnie, you know, I went to a HBCU for undergrad, and then I went to a PWI for um, my master's program. So, you mm-hmm. know, I was able to see the best. I mean, the you know, the both best of both worlds, essentially. Um. So I wouldn't say that it's any like inner fraternity rivalry or anything like that. Like, oh, you pledged at a PWI, so you know. I don't, I don't like you as a person or anything like that. No, it's not like that. Every process is different. No matter if you play at an HBCU or a PWI or a grad chapter, every, every process is different. Um, just speaking from Virginia State, our process compared to any other HBCU, whether it's Virginia Union, Norfolk State, is different. So it, it really doesn't matter about the PWI or HBCU thing. You know, I think it's too much emphasis on, you know, kind of differentiating between those two. Um, but I will say, okay. you know, it's a brotherhood. You know, when you travel, when you go to these other yards and campuses, um, you meet brothers and you, you know, you break down barriers and you move forward with them. So it's not, it's a way that you go about it. And, you know, I won't go too much in, into detail about it, but it's a way that you go about it. So it's no, oh, you pledged at a PWI. So, you know, you're not really a Q or nothing like that. So um, I think we can just end that stigma right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would agree with the brother there. I, I don't, I don't, I don't see any difference in, in internally in the fraternity as it relates to whether or not you went to a PWI or HBCU. Uh, I, I think one of the reasons why that doesn't happen is because uh, anybody generally, because we're set up in districts, brothers in the districts know who have a initiative in any school, whether it's PWI or HBCU. And so the brothers travel. So the brothers would get in the car and come see you, or you would be heard about. So it, it, there was always somebody had a relationship with that school, even right. though it may be you know, a PWI that could vouch for that school and say, oh, yeah, them brothers at uh, University of Maryland College Park, they they, they good. Because mm-hmm. yeah, somebody yeah. went to see them to to, to say, okay, yeah, yeah we, 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 yeah, they good. So <laughs> then there was no... Yeah, so you you just took the word of what somebody else said who validated them. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Okay. I got a question. I mean, it's it's not it's a little off of what we've been talking about. I mean, it's still with the frat, but have have any of y'all gotten branded? Like, does it hurt? I just want to ask. <laughs> <laughs> My chapter is known for brands, so I got about yeah forty three. I think. Ooh. So, man, man yeah. My, let me tell we're, you, we're, we're called the hit chapter, New Side. Yeah, they are, man. I'm going to tell you, man, I met a brand at New Side that had like 56 brands, man. And I, we used to think that was crazy, <laughs> man. I'm like, what in the world? Really? And yeah, right. I got six. I, I, I admit, I got six. I took five my first, the first time we had a session. And then one mm-hmm. of my LB line brothers wasn't there at that. And I took one with him the next year. Because we only did them annually. Dang. Okay. And okay. Uh, so, yeah, man, does it hurt? Yeah. <laughs> Don't let nobody lie to you. And I'll be honest with you, most people have had this impression that you're drunk or you, you, mm-hmm. you're out of it when it happens. Uh, me, personally, I had just came from church service, and the oh, brother was doing some hits. <laughs> and so I ain't had nothing to drink. Yeah, you was as now, as you could be in church. You was protected. Now, you I would take it if I could just... Yeah, man. Now, if I could describe it for someone who's never had one, it's 
it's not like most people think of it like you, you accidentally touch the stove and get burned. Mm-hmm. It's it's not the same thing because when when that happens, you actually are shocked because you're shocked mm-hmm. that you didn't mean to touch it. But when you see the heat coming, mm-hmm. it it feels like somebody actually takes the smallest piece of your skin, and mm-hmm. they have nails and they pinching it for for a period of seconds, and then mm-hmm. it stops. Yeah. The hardest part of it, and this I know this, bro, no. The healing process. It, 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 the healing process. <laughs> that's when it hurts. Right. Mm-hmm. Dang. Yeah. yeah, it's not. It's got a yeah, white we, t-shirt, bloody white t-shirts, all that. Yeah. Nah, that's, that's definitely dope. We, and we, you know, we definitely appreciate most of y'all coming on here and sharing your experiences, being transparent. Yeah, thank you. And the listeners know, like we really appreciate it. We can see, you know, the the uh, level of men that is coming from, you know, the Omega Psi Phi that's doing it the right way. So we definitely appreciate you guys. Um, I know Ronnie had another question. I wanted to find out about some of guys' professions, things like that. So you know, before y'all leave off of here, we want y'all to you know let everybody know what is it, what it is y'all do for a living. I kind of hinted at what you do, Daryl. So. Um, let us know what y'all do for a living, and, and if and people want to use y'all services, how they can get in contact with you and things like that. Absolutely, man. I, I can jump in. I'm actually an entrepreneur, uh, actually a business coach, and uh, I basically help small businesses uh, connect with re- uh, business generating revenue opportunities with other organizations that may look to do business with them. So basically got marry marry opportunities between businesses. And they just kind of pay me based on what they actually generate from that. They just mm-hmm. cut a piece of the cake. And okay. uh, so I okay. actually help people with staffing. I work with a couple clients that do staffing. So if there's people out there that are looking for IT opportunities or you're a company that's uh, looking for that type of talent, I have folks that can actually help you do that. And then my last uh, piece of my business that I help smaller businesses as well as individuals with is protecting their legal life. I've been a you know entrepreneur with Legal Shell now for 18 years, and that's been my primary business. So I help people uh, protect their rights uh, that they that, that you supposed to have, but don't always have the time have these means or financial means to exercise them. Okay, okay. all right. Do you have a website or anything? Anything where they can now, reach you can reach me my you, you just just email me at Ted at Right Talk W R I G H T A L K dot com and uh, my website's under construction because I wanted to pop off the page so I got a couple of people smarter than me working on that for me right now because okay. what I had wasn't what <laughs> I wanted to represent myself. Smart man, smart man. How about you, Daryl? Appreciate it, brother. Um. So I work in the mental health field. I know Ronnie hinted at it a little bit earlier. I'm a clinical supervisor at National Counseling Group, which is a mental health company um, based in Virginia, but, you know, we're in North Carolina, Georgia, um, and a couple other states. Um, We basically just provide mental health services to people with mental health diagnoses, um, do mental health skill building, intensive in-home, crisis stabilization, life skills coaching, parent coaching, things of that nature. So in my job, in my role, um, I just oversee a group of counselors, counselors, and kind of make sure that they're providing the, the clinical need, um, the clinical service that we need, um, the client needs. Um, also, I practice outpatient therapy on the side. Um, so if you are looking for a therapist or um, need help with finding a therapist, maybe in your network or in your area, um, feel free to, you know, reach out. Um, and if you're looking for particularly mental health services uh, with National Counseling Group, you can contact 804 804- Seven six seven three four seven zero, and I'll say that again. It's eight zero four seven six seven three four seven zero, and they will take your referral. Um, and, then, and this is for intensive in-home mental health skill building, uh, crisis stabilization, um, any services like that. Um, you can contact that number and make a referral. Um, and it's in return in regards to the therapy. Um, if you need a consultation, um, I have our number. Give me one second. I can pull it up. Um, the office number is 804-479-3113. That's 804-479-3113. Um, if you're looking for any therapy services or trying to get connected to a therapist, um, just reach out and we'll 
help you along the way. All right, definitely, definitely. Yeah, but hey man, hey man, I also want to give us, I want to give a shout out to HSRN as well, because I actually uh, do games with them. Uh, they broadcast they on the Heritage Sports Radio Network, so I definitely mm-hmm. want to give them a shout out because I'm going to continue to bring uh, talented people like Dr. Pitts and you guys to their network so that they can have these types of conversations that we had today. So uh, I know you guys are thanking us, uh, but I want to thank Dr. Pitts and you guys for being consistent right. week in and week out and bringing topics that our communities need to hear about and right. actually need to have people that's really talking about these issues and not just talking, but putting some things into action. So I appreciate you guys being a voice for that every week. Thank you. Right. We appreciate it. We appreciate that. Most thank you so much. Yeah, so oh, we thank you guys. Thank you guys. And, um, you know, wrap up the show, but we definitely appreciate you guys. Y'all have a happy, happy holiday. Stay safe. Pray that you guys' families are safe, and you guys take care. We appreciate you once again. All right, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Right, you, you guys stay safe as well. Wear your mask. Wear your mask. Wear your mask. <laughs> oh yeah, yes sir. All right, y'all take care. Y'all, y'all take right. care. Thank you. All right, thank y'all. Yeah, so we definitely. Two great um, guests in the, in the call-ins today definitely gave a lot of insight. You know, I would say as Ronnie and I, you know, we both played football, but neither one of us were a part of um, one of the uh, Divine Nine. And, you know, definitely we all have our opinions, but I'm grateful that they were able to share their opinions and we were able to have the, a real conversation and respect each other. And, you know, I learned some things that I didn't know before, and I'm definitely grateful for that. So, you know, once again, we definitely appreciate them coming on. And I think it was definitely a powerful conversation um, that we've had. Absolutely. And I I definitely appreciate them sharing their viewpoints on fraternities. Um, And like, you know, like Jerry said, you know, me and Jerry both uh, chose not to uh, go that route and pledge Greek. However, you know, we had our own brotherhoods with our football teams and things like that. And, you know, um, my only thing to somebody, you know, to a young listener out there or even, you know, somebody who's, uh, you know, maybe not an undergrad and you're thinking about joining a fraternity or sorority, <clears throat> one of the things that we talked about and the two brothers definitely highlighted was, you know, understanding about having your own identity outside of, you know, that fraternity or sorority. And, you know, even for me and Jared, we've talked about in recent episodes about, you know, having your identity outside of sports. And I think that's mm-hmm. important no matter what no matter what relationship or organization or dynamic you're a part of, having your own identity established outside of all of those, even in a marriage, you know, even in marriage when they say you become one, you know, me and my wife, we have our own identities outside of our marriage. Um, you know, so having that identity and knowing who you are in, you know, Daryl made a great point. You know, he was 19 at the time when he had pledged, and I'm pretty sure Mr. Wright was also – you know, 19 or 20, 21, somewhere around there when he plays as well. So, you know, the thought process and the decision-making process is, you know, a lot different than somebody who's a lot older. However, mm-hmm. you know, make sure you do your research, you know, make sure you talk to, you know, numerous people in those uh, fraternities and sororities if you're expressing interest, and make sure you're doing it for your own personal right reasons, whether that's networking, brotherhood, sisterhood, um, you know, doing the good work that those fraternities and sororities do do, you know, make sure you have your reasons grounded and you know that while you're going on this journey um, that you're doing it for the right reasons and not to, you know, dehumanize somebody else or put somebody else down or to rise your stature because you did something that somebody else chose not to do. Um, you know, you know, those type of people, whether it's a football team, fraternity, sorority, Fortune 500 company, those people will bring down your organization in a heartbeat. And uh, Jerry can attest to this. You know, Coach used to always say, your own your football team is only as good as your worst player. So if yep. your worst player is going to bring down the team, you know, same thing can happen in a fraternity or sorority. You know, that member who isn't doing it for the right reasons and is, you know, um, misusing their rights as being in a fraternity or sorority can bring down that whole organization as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I think another important thing that they both mentioned and hit on, and it's kind of, um, you know, runs parallel with football, is, you know, if you are in a fraternity sorority, you're at the school for four years, five years, or if you do grad chapter, don't let that be the end of, you know, using the benefits that it can offer you. Don't let that be 
the end of your college career be the last time that you network with somebody from the same frat or sorority. You have to make sure you got to build on those relationships um, that you've made throughout the years with the right people so you can progress and move forward in life, you know, once you do um, leave college. And I think, you know, once you guys do that, as our guest mentioned, you do it the right way, you'll definitely set your, yourself up. You know, like they mentioned on resumes and having somebody that has the same, you know, aligned values with you that came from, comes from the same organization can definitely get your foot in the door that you might not have been able to um, if you did not have that um, that uh, stature behind you. So definitely take that into consideration. And as Ronnie said, do it for, you know, you know, make sure you have the right morals going into it. And we appreciate you know, all of you guys um, listening to today's show. Um, once again, we want to send our condolences out to Dr. Pitt um, and anyone else out there who's going through tough times with, you know, what's going on in the world. Our prayers are with you um, and, and everything. And we just appreciate you guys again. Ron, if you have anything else to say, let us know. Um, then we'll close it out. Uh, no, nah, just uh, like Jared said, also, you know, sending my condolences to uh, Dr. Pitts and her family. You know, our prayers are with you. Can't wait to have you back next week on the show. Uh, we definitely missed you today. Um, and to everybody else out there, um, you know, please continue to stay safe, wear your mask, wash your hands, drink plenty of water, eat your fruits and vegetables, um, you know, and, you know, continue to hold on to your loved ones, cherish them every single day, make the most of today and not worry about tomorrow because the only thing we'll promise is today. And I uh, hope everybody enjoys the rest of their holiday weekend. Um, you know, continue to eat them. Le- hey, look, by Monday, them leftovers got to be gone, all right? That, that, that's all right. it. By Monday, leftovers got to be out the fridge, all right? So don't Please hold on to them leftovers for two weeks after Thanksgiving. Christmas um, Eve, they might be they frozen. They might, you might see some yams pop up <laughs> from, from Thanksgiving. You, you know, you know. So certain, we'll certain dishes can remain a, a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But um, definitely, man, happy Thanksgiving, happy holidays to everybody. We'll see you guys next week. Stay safe, stay blessed, and take care.